Hey, what's up garden friends? Jeff here, Tropical Plant Party. How's everybody doing? I hope you're good. I am great. Who remembers this one? This is a Chinese fan palm. I planted up several months ago in like a assorted tropical colorful container sort of thing. And it's time to actually break this down and move it in. I don't think I'm gonna do the breaking it down part in this video. All I mean by that is I'm just gonna cut all the stuff out that's growing around the sides of the pot, except maybe the crotons. However, somebody did ask me to do a video on how to take care of the Chinese fan palms indoors, which I really haven't done. I did a video a few years ago, a uh, very different kind of quality, so it'd be nice if you check that video out. But it was about growing the Chinese fan palms outdoors as a perennial in a cooler climate, like zone six and seven sort of thing as a dieback perennial, meaning that the foliage dies off and comes back every year. But that's not what this is. I actually didn't cover anything about indoor care with it in that video. I thought this might be a good opportunity to go ahead and talk about those things, how to keep this inside as a house plant. Uh, I've had to kind of move to an area where my umbrella is going to shelter things a little bit. The lighting is a little bit harsh. It's the camera focus, you know, when things are filtered properly. So pardon the umbrella in the shot there. I actually think that that looks kind of nice against the fronds but not when it's just like in a little corner you know what i mean there goes that wind blowing stuff right off the table anyways chinese fan palm livestona chinensis sometimes the windmill palms are also called a chinese fan palm that's a different plant i have one back here behind this robolini behind the pygmy date palm you can see they don't look the same they have very different characteristics We're talking about Livestona chinensis here. That's this plant. Chinese fan palms, fully hardy zones 8B and up. They're a slow to moderate grower depending on the age of the plant. Their lighting means are also kind of variable depending on the age of the plant. When it's a young juvenile plant, lower to moderate light is fine and then as they mature they're going to need more and more light. Pretty common with a lot of palm trees. When you think about it, when they start growing, oftentimes it's from seeds that fall down to the forest floor where things are nice and shady, and then they grow and stretch, move towards that light, oxen and all kinds of hormonal fun things are happening, and then they get to a size where they can access the brighter light and then they need it. Do you know what I'm saying? It's because of that, when you're growing these inside, they tend to not get huge when they're grown in a pot. I mean, they will someday, eventually, but like I said, they're not the fastest growers. However, when they're smaller, like the size I have this one at right here, they grow fairly quickly, really. I, this one, if I were to compare it back to the video back in, I don't know, what was it, May, maybe, when I threw this planter together, it's put on a lot of growth, and that's because it's a smaller plant. It's, you know, rushing to reach to a size where it would be able to reach that light if it were outdoors growing in nature. But then eventually they would get big enough where they've reached the light and they can slow down and chill and go, oh, wait, everything's okay. We can calm things down a little bit. And when they reach that point, that's when they have a trunk. So typically when these are grown inside, a Chinese fan palm doesn't have a trunk, or at least not much of a trunk to speak of. So you can see in here, that's about what they get. That'll get wider and wider and wider as time goes by and more girthy. They have some husk in there and some really nice sharp little daggers growing up those stems. And that's about what to expect from these in the long run when being grown indoors. Though over many, many, many years, they will eventually grow a trunk. It just, it happens a lot faster when they're grown in the ground than in a pot. Oh, at this smaller, more petite size, when the foliage is still somewhat immature, hasn't fully fanned out to their big glorious fans they get when they're a little bit older. The foliage is still more of a uh, yellowy green color. It'll get darker green with age. When they're smaller like this, sorry, I know it seems like I'm taking a long time to get to the point, but I like to give the reasoning behind. Like there, I like for people to know the logic behind why the plant likes what it likes. I just think it makes for a better understanding of plants in general. So indoor lighting, you give them bright light. They'll, they'll take bright light. It doesn't need to be direct. If they are getting direct light, make sure it's not too close to the windows so that it's not being magnified too intensely. You don't want to burn the foliage on them, but they're a uh, highlight plant. Well, they actually can take some lower light conditions in the house. It's smart to back off on the watering somewhat if that's the placement of the plant. If they're not getting a lot of light, if they're not in an active, like super high mode growth rate, then calm down with the watering because it'll end up just rotting the plant. A southern exposure, southeastern, southwestern, whatever, as long as it's bright for a few hours a day. I'd say at least four to five hours in a very 
well-lit room. That's what they will appreciate the most. Okay, I know that was a really long explanation for the lighting. Sorry about that. I just wanna make sure everybody understands that the lighting is somewhat variable depending on the size of the plant. The older and more mature, the larger those leaves get the more light that it's going to need. When it comes to watering Chinese fan palms, I do tend to just follow the general rule of thumb I do with pretty much most house plants, which is that when the top inch, two inches at the max of the surface soil, when that dries out, I go ahead and water it. And I water it until the water goes all the way out the bottom of the pot. That way I know it's received a nice heavy watering. If that water doesn't come out the bottom of the pot, then you're not guaranteed that water even got into the root zone. So that defeats the purpose, right? You need to make sure that soil gets saturated, briefly at least, when you water the plant. They do not like standing water though. Most palm trees don't, at least not many palm trees that are grown commonly as house plants. So uh, I would avoid putting this in a uh, tray that is sitting in water. If you do decide, and I wouldn't blame you, to put a tray underneath a Chinese fan palm, then make sure that there's some pebbles or something in that tray so that the bottom of the pot's not in contact with any of the water. That way it doesn't wick it back up. It just creates a whole mess among the roots. Essentially, you lose oxygen around the root zone and there's rot and die off and nutrients can't be transported to the foliage the way they need to be. It's, just, it's a mess. You get it. Don't let the roots stay sopping wet for too terribly long. They like a very well-drained, organically rich soil. And it, I mean, they're a pretty sturdy palm. If the soil's like somewhat barren, it's more if you're growing it outdoors. But if that's the case, they will be okay. You might have to up your fertilizing a little bit. In a pot, there's really no reason that should happen, right? When it's being grown in a container, use a nice, good quality soil blend where the water can move through it sharply, meaning that basically when you're standing there with your watering can, I was gonna say hose, probably not using a hose when you're in the house. You want that water to hit the surface of the soil. It can pool up momentarily, but you wanna see it move through there fast. Watering is always one of the more difficult things to talk about when it comes to house plant care. And that's because there are so many variables. We're mostly where someone lives and the conditions in their home. If you have really, really dry air and uh, your house temperatures are very, very warm, then you're going to need to water the plant much more frequently. If you live someplace where your winters are very, very humid, but maybe cool, then you're gonna need to be more careful with the watering because that water is not going to evaporate from the root zone very fast or get taken up by the plant as quickly. Cooler temperatures, the plant's not going, oh, I wanna grow really fast. It's like, no, no, I'm just gonna kinda get by until things warm up and there's more light and then that water doesn't get used and rot. Again, head plant, don't want that. Which leads me on to fertilizing. Fertilizing is necessary, of course, but it's best to only fertilize these during the active growing season. Active growing season meaning, well, I mean, it's, it's what it sounds like, right? When the plant's growing actively. Active growing season meaning uh, basically spring and summer, right? Day lengths are longer, temperatures are hopefully more warm, but you know, if it's being grown in the house, then that's not necessarily the case. I just use a general all-purpose fertilizer with most of my palms and probably every month or so, I'll use a little bit of like the Espoma Plant Tone or the Jack's Classic Palm Fertilizer. I really like that one. The main thing to look for is just a fertilizer that has a good blend of micros and macros. You want to see lots of good stuff in that fertilizer. Potassium, iron, manganese, those sorts of things. Those are things palms really like in their fertilizer. Like I said, once a month, spring and summer, should be just fine. It's a good idea to back off of the fertilizing roughly, I'd say, uh, anywhere from four to six weeks before the change of the season into the fall time. It's mostly true when growing these outdoors or for someone like me who's growing them outdoors and then moves them inside during those winter months. I want the plant to be not in a state of like go, 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 go if cold temperatures should come about because that can shock the plant in a much more harsh way than it would if it were just kind of chilling. You know what I'm saying? Now in the home during the winter months, if this gets fertilized, and this is true of a lot of house plants, then sometimes that will tell the plant, hey, keep growing. Even though the day lengths aren't really telling the plant that it should be in that faster state of growth, it'll still think that it needs to do that because fertilizer, it's not quite that simple. There's a whole hormonal thing that happens with lighting and the foliage and plant growth, but the fertilizer is going to kind of keep the plant moving when it doesn't need to. And then you can end up with a really stretched out, lanky, uh, it's not great looking plant. And as a generalization, there are circumstances where it's necessary to give some fertilizer during the winter if you're noticing nutrient deficiencies. So move on 
to that now. Be true, spring, summer, really any time of year if you're noticing like a lot of yellow spots on the foliage, yellowy spots with brown centers, things like that, brown spots with yellow centers. Those, these are usually symptoms of deficiencies, usually a metal deficiency like manganese, iron, potassium, which is an, a metal, I know. So if that becomes the case, then by all means fertilize and just make sure that every time you water, it gets just a little bit of fertilizer to help give it those nutrients that it's missing and showing in the foliage that it needs it. Like I said, that would be a circumstance where be justified, give the plant some fertilizer during the winter months. But like I said, still just a little, don't, don't overdo it. When deficiencies start to show in the foliage of a palm, I uh, prefer to fertilize in smaller doses more frequently as opposed to just, oh, I think there's a manganese deficient here. Let me go ahead and just fertilize it with something really high in manganese like once a month. That doesn't really help. And that's when I will go ahead and give it a very little, small amount of fertilizer pretty much every single time I water the plant. And I mean small amount, like maybe a quarter of the dose. And that just, it helps keep those nutrients moving through the plant instead of it being like, okay, I got some of it, but not all of it. Now I have to wait a few more weeks to get it again. If you're noticing deficiencies in uh, your palm or pretty much any house plant and it's getting the fertilizer that would make it so that there shouldn't be that problem. There can sometimes be an issue with tap water, sometimes fluoride can uh, um, inhibit certain nutrients from being taken up by plants. Sometimes just the water being too alkaline or too acidic can be a problem. That's when you have to start going through the process of eliminations and trying different things out. They do prefer their soil a little bit more on the acidic side than the alkaline side. So like anywhere from probably six and a half to 7.4, which is 7.4 is not acidic. Seven is neutral. So it's moving more towards the alkaline area, but somewhere in there, that's a pretty happy place. If they're not a really complicated plant though, worrying about the pH probably wouldn't be necessary, but it is something to factor in if those nutrient deficiencies are present and there's no rhyme or reason for it. And that's when it's time to start looking at the soil conditions and whatnot. That whole process gets kind of complicated and I'm gonna make this video very, very, very long. So maybe that's something I could do a separate video on at some point if people are interested. Troubleshooting with plants can be a lengthy drawn out process. And there again, like with watering plants, there are just so many variables. It'd be really hard to cover that all of that in one video. And I don't really think it's necessary because like I said, these are a pretty sturdy palm. I don't think that having issues with deficiencies is going to be really, really common with this palm for most people. So just you, you go ahead and ask me if, <laughs> directly. You can hit me up in the comments or on Instagram, something like that, and we'll talk about it. I can help you out. Repotting. Now, general consensus with palm trees is that they like to be somewhat root bound. Really doesn't make it that easy to care for them in the home. That's the only issue with that. If they're too root bound, then there's just not much soil around those roots. The roots have pushed a lot of the soil out of the pot over the years and through watering and whatnot. And so you'll have to water more frequently. If you've just bought a Chinese fan palm and you're trying to decide what size pot to put it in, I usually would suggest bumping up the pot to like one to a two and a half inches on the outside diameter of the pot. Meaning that if your root mass is 12 inches in diameter, then move it into a pot that's probably 14. That would be fine. And repeat every couple of years. That should do the trick. I think every other year is a good way to go with repotting most house plants. And it's gonna depend on how fast it's growing. If yours is growing really, really, really fast and you're watering it and watering it and watering it and the poor thing just is always looking thirsty or deficient in some sort of way. Maybe there's roots showing up out of the top of the pot and out of the bottom or one or the other. Those are signs that, okay, it's probably time to go ahead and bump it up a pot size, which on average would be like every other year, probably with these Chinese fan palms. Now, like I had mentioned, when they're smaller, I've noticed they tend to grow a lot more quickly. And by smaller, I mean, they just kind of have these sort of immature fan shaped leaves on them. When the Chinese fan palm gets larger, the fans tend to be a little bit of a darker green and they are very, very wide, very broad. And there's not typically as much of a stretch on them from the trunk. And that also has a lot to do with lighting as well. So less light, then they're going to send those fans up. Those palm fronds are gonna come up much higher reaching for the light, whereas in really, really, really high intense bright light, they'll be closer down towards the center of the plant, towards the crown. 
They will over time start to have some foliage that yellows, usually younger, more immature growth should be what yellows and starts to die off more quickly. I'm trying to find some here. There we go, right there. That should be next in line as far as starting to yellow and die off. It's happening with more new growth. That's something to be concerned about. Could mean too much water, not enough light, too much light. I mean, there are a lot of things that can contribute to that. However, with the smaller, older growth, that is typically what's going to go first. And once that starts to yellow, you can go in with a pair of snippers and just cut it right out. It's just going to keep on dying back and it's not going to do anything for the plant, so just get it out of there. That doesn't need to stay around. It's the case with any yellowing, browning foliage on, I mean, most plants. Over time, it's just going to attract pests because it's going to decay and pests like to help things decay. They serve a purpose, but not always one that's really useful when it comes to keeping your plants inside. It can be problematic. Now, you may notice in the house, sometimes the tips of these fronds, of these big fan leaves, they'll get some yellow on them and turn brown. That usually just means that the air is kind of dry for them. Or maybe they're near a draft, something like that, and it's blowing moisture out of the foliage. Close to a heat source or an air conditioning source, it's just something's moving moisture out of the plant which just means you need to increase humidity, maybe relocate the plant. They don't want to be set someplace that's really, really drafty. Live someplace that has really cold, chilly winters, you know, I mean, like even just temperatures below 50 during winter time. Probably not great to keep it too close to a door because every time that door opens and closes, cold air is going to hit the plant and plants like consistency. So that wouldn't be great for it. Again, ceiling fans, vents, anything that's moving too much air around the plant and drying, or I should say dry air around the plant that can be one of those issues too. One of the things causing that the tips to brown is what I'm getting at. Or check the surface of your soil. Sometimes the plant's being underwatered and that can contribute to those brown and yellow tips as well. Or general rules with pretty much any hout plant, hout plant, <laughs> house plant. It's a good idea to be sure to go ahead and rotate the plants every so often so that they have nice even growth towards the light, especially if they're being grown in a corner up against a wall, which is pretty normally not. I don't think a lot of people just say the plants in the middle of their rooms, so then those rooms are evenly lit, right? I'd say um, probably every couple weeks, sometimes even once a month, depending on the speed of growth for that plant with these, they're not going to grow too terribly fast during the winter months in the house. So I'd say once a month, it's probably fine. Give the plant a little bit of a turn so that things stay nice and even. Keep that foliage clean. Dust likes to build up on the foliage. That blocks light from getting into the cells of the plant as efficiently as it needs to, from being able to provide that energy for things to photosynthesize and whatnot. Easy things to do. It's pretty simple and it's going to vary from home to home depending on just how dusty things are really, but if you just take like a maybe one to three drops of just a general dish soap, something that's not heavily scented or dyed or anything like that, but a dish soap, Dawn works fine. Put that in a spray bottle with some warm water, shake it up, spray the foliage down, and then wipe that off with a cloth. And that'll help get the dust off. And doing that on a routine schedule with houseplants also does help reduce the uh, risk of pests coming in, particularly spider mites. It helps a lot with reducing the risk of spider mites. Having higher humidity, good airflow, and keeping that foliage clean makes a difference. Not that spider mites are attracted to dirty foliage. That's not the case. It's the application of that soapy water doing that occasionally if they were to show up it's going to help slowly suffocate them out and just maybe more control them might not fully remove them like using a neem oil or something like that would but it just helps cut back on the risk a little bit common pests spider mites spider mites they seem to enjoy these palms a fair amount like i mentioned dry air lack of airflow that that's the spider mites very happy mealy bugs common problem scale hard scale and soft scale more hard scale through my experience at least those are seem to be pretty common on a lot of palms i've never had issue with white fly but i have heard from others that that's been a problem for them so keep a close eye on your plants check the tops and bottoms of the foliage and especially down there in the crown when you're dealing with mealy bugs because they hide in all those little nooks and crannies and if you have an issue with insects, then oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. No fun to deal with. But typically, if the plant's small enough, take it to a shower, something like that. Blast everything off of it that you can. Give it a nice heavy application of neem until it runs off the foliage through the tops, the bottoms, everything. Uh, or dish soap, like I talked about with cleaning the foliage. That same application would work well. A diluted peppermint oil. Lots of options out there to give a try before moving on to harsher chemicals. It's always good to start with something safe first 
see how that works, give it a go for several weeks before going too hard on the plant. And the name is great, it says antifungal properties, which is fantastic. That's because the Chinese fan palms, I mean, most palms really, will rot out fairly quickly if water or just too much moisture in general collects down in the crown. In the center of the plant where all that foliage is emerging, that's, you don't want moisture sitting in there. So when you water the plant, be sure to water the surface of the soil, not the center of the plant that can cause a lot of problems. If you start to notice some type of rot going on in the center, then using a, you can try neem, you can start with neem because it does have antifungal properties, but the main thing is to dry that out as quickly as possible. And then a, a copper-based fungicide usually is what works best to really treat that problem. Or, I mean, if you have any hope of treating it, that's usually the route to go. You can spray that all the way down there in that center and you'll follow the directions on the package because each one's different, but apply as necessary or as it's labeled, I should say. And that is one of the few times I do recommend fertilizing the plant, even if it's out of season. If there's rot going on, start treating the rot and uh, get it cleared up. And then giving the plant a good fertilizing can help push the new growth out and get things moving so that there's not just a lot of death and decay going on down in the crown. It shouldn't be too much of an issue for most people growing these inside. Uh, typically, if the Chinese fan palm starts to rot when being grown as a house plant, it's just because it's being overwatered in general, not necessarily because there's a lot of water sitting in the crown. But those two things can also kind of go together, right? Okay, lengthy, I know, but I like to be thorough. That way th there's less questions to answer for one. And I don't mind answering questions, ask away. There's nothing wrong with that. But in general, it's hard to call something a care video, right? if someone's left with a lot of questions. So yeah, lengthy, sure. But the point was to be thorough, right? It's a care video. Want to make sure to cover all the bases. Oh, last thing. I am going to be removing all the stuff from down here in the center of the plant before I bring it in. I might leave the crotons or I'll pull them out and repop them into something else. This dusty miller is looking a little bit thirsty, isn't it? Doesn't matter. I'm cutting all that out today. The reason for that is that it's just a few weeks from when I need to start moving these inside. And uh, like I was talking about with that crown rot and just issues with water being in there, it's easier to not have a lot of things planted around the base of these because that holds a little bit of the moisture in, which can be helpful if you live in a really, really dry environment. I don't though. Winters are kind of dry, but still I prefer for there to be more airflow around the crowns of the plants where everything is coming up out of the centers, right? More airflow just helps reduce the risk of rot and pests and those things. So that's why I'm removing everything, but to each his own. You do you, give it a shot. You want to underplant it that you could put a pothos underneath one of these that would probably do well, but you'd want to keep it out of the center because it'll choke them out. Lodendrons, I mean, there's all kinds. There's tons of things you could pot with these. I prefer just to have it clean and open though. That way I can see everything that's going on and have to water it a little bit less because I'm not supporting all these other plants growing in the pot. Okay, pretty sure it covered everything there. Look how long this creeping Jenny's gotten. Isn't that ridiculous? So, so, so much growth out of that. Don't forget to leave the video a thumbs up. It makes a really big difference for the videos and for the channel, so thank you. Subscribe as well and hit that notification bell. I upload multiple times a week, and that way you'll know when new videos come out. I have all my social media linked down below, down there in the description. You can go ahead and give me a follow. I use Instagram, like, way more than anything thing else that's a good place to get a hold of me though if you do have questions sometimes the comments on youtube can be a little bit sketchy i don't always get notified of new comments or it's it's complicated and comment down below say hi if you have anything to add about this plant please do so i want to make sure that everything is covered and it is like impossible to do that in one video in one person there's always every time i finish editing there's always something i think of even though like i do an outline there's always still something so anything anyone ever has to contribute always welcomed and appreciated helps keep things moving help people learn that's the whole point right overall pretty easy to grow plant at least that's been my experience not usually too fussy the yellowing and browning tips is usually the biggest issue i ever have with them so you can just put them in a room with a humidifier a bathroom just an area with nice moist air that'll do the trick normally or you can use an anti-transpirant see always hang out to the end that's a good tip you can use something like no wilt on the foliage when you have these inside. It just helps lock the moisture into the foliage so that the vapor, so the water doesn't get blown out. In really dry environments, that can be a really nifty thing to have around. Okay, that's the last tip. I hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life, and everything's just going beautifully for you. And of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.